Hello everyone and welcome to this revision video for A-Level Law taught and today we're going to be looking at the Occupiers Liability Act 1984. Now this is the second revision video on the Occupiers Liability Act. I have done a separate one on the Occupiers Liability Act 1957 but this is just a very quick tutorial to remind you of the key elements on the Occupiers Liability Act 1984 which was designed to confirm firm situations where a duty of care might be owed by an occupier to a trespasser. If you remember the 57 Act is all about the duty owed by an occupier to people that are lawfully entitled to be on the premises whereas the 84 Act is designed for trespasses. Just an exam tip for you, quite often in taught law exams, when you've got an issue of occupier's liability, the scenario will often involve um, lawful visitors under the 57 Act, and then quite often what happens is that one of the visitors sort of strays from an area where they're allowed to be and goes to somewhere where they don't necessarily have permission to be and thereby becoming potentially a trespasser. So quite often you'll have to apply both the 57 and the 84 Act. So this flowchart is designed just to summarise the steps that you need to go through if you're trying to determine whether your claimant is going to be successful under this Act of Parliament. So the first thing to note about the Occupiers Liability Act 84 is that it imposes a duty on occupiers in relation to persons other than his visitors under section 11a and this includes trespassers and those persons who are just mentioned who might have exceeded their permission by going somewhere in a property that they're not entitled to be. So the first issue that we need to determine is first of all whether our defendant is in fact an occupier. An occupier is given the same meaning as under the 1957 Act, Section 1-2, which directs us to look at the common law and the case of Wheaton Lacon. And the case of Wheaton Lacon, if you recall, um, it provides the occupational test for determining whether somebody is an occupier or not. And it is whether they retain occupational control over the premises and there may be more than one occupier of one premises. Premises is also going to remain the same as in the 1957 Act and it's not just um, including houses or buildings, it also includes injuries or damage caused on any vehicle, vessel or aircraft. So let's take a look then at the duty that is owed to trespasses. Now, since the Occupiers Liability Act 1984 applies to trespassers, as you would imagine, a lower level of protection is offered compared to under the 1957 Act. So death and personal injury are the only protected forms of damage that are entitled to be claimed for under this Act. So unlike the 57 Act, an occupier is not going to be liable to damage to a trespasser's property. So if your trespasser breaks a watch, they're not going to be able to claim for that under the 84 Act. Whereas if um, a lawful visitor sustained damage to the watch because of the state of premises, they could potentially claim for that under the 57 Act. So section 1.3 of the 84 Act lists the circumstances that give rise to a duty of care under the 84 Act. And under section 1.3, it says that occupiers owe a duty to another not being their visitor if a. He is aware of the danger or has reasonable grounds to believe it exists. b. He knows or has reasonable grounds to believe the other is in the vicinity of the danger or may come into the vicinity of the danger. C. The risk is one in which all the circumstances of the case he may reasonably be expected to offer the other some protection. And if all three of these circumstances are present, then the occupier owes a duty of care to the non-lawful visitor. And as we've already mentioned, under section 1, subsection 4, the duty here is to ensure that they are not injured. It doesn't extend to liability for property. So a useful case to look at here is Jolly and Sutton. 
We also looked at this under the 57 Act because it involved children. And if you recall, it was two teenage boys who were playing on an old, broken, abandoned boat that had been left on the council's land. And they were quite seriously injured. And if you remember, the facts of the case were that the um, defendant council were held liable for the injuries to the children because it was seen as reasonably foreseeable that children would be injured playing or meddling with the boat. And of course, the council were aware of the danger. They knew it was there. They knew that children were in the vicinity of the danger. And really, they ought reasonably to have offered some protection because it was reasonably foreseeable that those children would be injured. So Jolly and Sutton shows a nice example of where a duty to trespasser a trespasser, sorry, will be held. Another case that you may like to look at on the 84 Act is Tomlinson and Congleton. And once again, we looked at this under the 57 Act because it involved um, giving a warning sign and whether it was necessary to give a warning sign um, next to a pond where people swam um, and where the claimant was injured. So it's useful here because the duty under the 84 Act may be discharged by giving a warning or discouraging others from taking the risk under Section 1.5 of the 84 Act. But just as we mentioned before, there's no obligation in relation to the warning to enable the visitor to be reasonably safe. Um, so there's a slight difference there. And another useful case to look at is Revel and Newbury, a classic and rather controversial case, which gives us the principle that protections even afforded to those who are breaking into the premises with criminal intent. If you recall the facts of this case, William Newbury was sleeping in a shed on his allotment to protect his property at night because he kept being broken into and he suspected it was going to happen again. Um, and Newbury fired a 12 bore shotgun through a hole in the shed door um, and, and shot our claimant. And our claimant, of course, was a trespasser on the property and he was suing under the 84 Act. And the principle was that under Section 1 of the 84 Act, an occupier cannot treat a trespasser as an outlaw and owes a duty to him that the trespasser does not suffer injury on the premises. So that's our whistle-stop tour of the Occupiers Liability Act 1984. I hope this quick little revision video has been helpful in just outlining what the key issues are when you're trying to determine whether a claimant is going to be successful under this Act or not. And just a reminder of some key cases that are really useful to know on this topic. You might want to watch some of my other videos on occupiers' liability to help you apply the law to scenarios and to evaluate it uh, for an essay-type question.